morning, saints. The word of the Lord revealed to us today is from Numbers 20, verses 1 to 13. Can you hear me well enough? Yep. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert in Zin and they stayed at Kadesh, where Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarrelled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there was no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then, the, then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honour me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I give them. These were the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarrelled and the Lord with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. This is the word of the Lord. All right, how are we all going? It's been a pretty big week. It's been a cool week for November. It's been kind of nice, thing. Eh? Now, the last couple of weeks we've been looking at a topic that was way bigger than we thunk it was going to be. Is that right? Blood in the water. Oh, yeah, two things. Probably find a few things that relate to that. But we've been discovering in particular, even last week, Genesis to Revelation, the very last chapter. This theme, blood and water. And even blood and water and the spirit, how the three testify and it all goes together as if God pre-planned it before we were even thought of. And we see some of these stories in the Old Testament with Moses we're going to look at today and we go, wow, that's a really pretty cool story. They make some good movies about the Moses stuff, right? And sometimes you think the one we're going to look at today, it's where Moses waxed the rock second time so this happened twice we're going to check out both times and we don't understand fully what's going on there because at times God seems really lenient the other time it's like man that was harsh the punishment didn't really fit the crime however we know that God knows what he's on about and he's fair and he's just but he's also holy so we're going to try and unpack and I hope and pray today that you'll be stick with me because I got bookmarks in my Bible. There's about four places we'll visit, and most of them will be on the screen. I've tried to put some work into knowing where I'm going. However, my bookmarks have the notes where to go next. So if I've got a well, papers flying everywhere, hopefully uh, we get through this. Numbers 20 is where we're kicking off. We had a good prayer time this morning and we prayed that you'll understand what I'm talking about. So let's see how we go. Numbers 20, so we can have that on the screen. We'll follow through. I'll quickly skip through the first few verses uh, because when I get to verse 8, 
We're going to skip back to Exodus again. Oh, wrong page already. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin. They stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. That's a pretty significant event because Miriam, Moses' sister, was there from the very beginning. Um, so that would have been a big deal for them. We won't do much with that today, but as something else to look into. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert? We've, that we, we and our livestock should die here. Why did you bring us out from Egypt to this terrible place? It is no grain, figs, grapevines, pomegranates, nothing even to drink. So you'll see, we're about to flick back to where this happened about 38 years earlier. The most likely exact spot, the same people except the next generation, because the older generation had all passed away for their disobedience. But you'll notice they say, instead of why did you lead us out of Egypt to die, which they say that actually word for word too, but before that they say, why didn't we perish with our other brothers? There's a story of the sons of Korah when they rebelled and then the earth opened up and swallowed them up. There's a TV series of that has got a similar theme going on. I don't know what it's called, some weird name where the middle of New York City just becomes this great hole and everything's fallen down it. I'd love to see how God did that, where the earth swallowed him up. It would have been terrifying. Now these guys are saying, well, we may as well have gone down the hole with them. And they're grumbling almost word for word from what their parents had said two dec four decades earlier. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down. I think that, was there something they tripped over? No, they realized that they were in big trouble yet again. And the people were going to have them guts for guard as if they didn't figure this out. And I love this, the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Wouldn't you love for every time you're in a crisis, you could just come here and fall on your face and there he appears to talk to you face to face. There's ways we can allow him to speak to us, but Moses had a special privilege. He, they, he spoke to God like a friend face to face. That would have been just amazing. So it was very clear when God spoke to Moses exactly what was said. It wasn't just an inkling. It wasn't just kind of an idea or a thought to pass on. There was word for word instruction. The Lord said to Moses, verse 7, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Let's stop there for a second. Let's flick back a few books. Go to Exodus 17, verse 6. So he's told, been told to take the staff. What's the staff? Well, that's people that work for him, right? Take all your staff. No, this is the stick. Now, it's you can be deciphered um, rod, the shepherd's crook thing was often called a rod where you, the shepherd leads his, his sheep. Or I've seen them when they got the tight part of the hook, they could grab, the, I've seen guys do this, they grab the sheep like whoop around the ankle and the sheep's like bah! They can't get away, it's really cool. This stuff though was not just any stick. Exodus 17, 6, if you've got your place there. Or 17, 5, actually. The Lord answered Moses, walk on ahead of the people. This is the exact moment for their parents, okay? So we've gone back nearly 40 years. Walk ahead of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile. And go. So this is the same stick. When you go through to the Exodus story earlier, the same stick where he held it over this and he did that and it turned into a snake. This is a special stick. So he's carried it around for 38 years without losing it. I wonder if it had wear marks in it by then or was it shorter when he's walked with it? It even oh, it's, would have been a special stick. You know, have your favourite walking stick? Well, this one was considered super special for obvious reasons 
But I was thinking about this. This is the stick where in this back in in the Exodus part, he was told to go for one of the play for one of the plagues, yeah. He was told to go to the river Nile and strike the water. And what happened then? It probably made a splash, but then the entire Nile River turned red blood. And then all the frogs and fish died and the frogs came out and all that probably was interrelated naturally. The frogs couldn't stand to be in there or whatever. But I was thinking about this. Here we go again, the blood. Moses struck the river and blood flowed from that point. Now, later on, we're still in Exodus, he's to strike the rock. He says, we're still in Exodus 17, he says, I will stand there before you, God talking to Moses, by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Not sure, we didn't have all that part there, but I've read on a little bit further. Is the Lord among us or not? The symbolism here of the rock being struck, we're about to see, we, many of you already know that this rock not just alludes to, but in God's mind, there was a big story being told here. And the question was, the people were saying, we've been led to a place, it looks like, of utter hopelessness. If something doesn't change, we are doomed and so are our women and children and all our livestock. Is God with us or is he not? And hence the grumbling, complaining to Moses. And then Moses was called to strike the rock. And what happened? Life-giving water flowed from that rock. And the question was answered. You remember the last couple of weeks we're thinking, so where's Jesus in all this? I want you to picture the moment where the disciples were sitting in front of the cross and their saviour, their best friend, their teacher, the one they had all their hopes placed on, was hanging there, gasping for breath in absolute torture and dying. Surely their question was the same as the Israelites. Is God here or not? What on earth is happening? If God's been involved to this point, why are we here? And why is he there? And where to from here? The uttermost desperate question, is God here? Is the Lord among us or not? But if we look at that same passage there, it says, God says to Moses, I will be there. I will stand before you by the rock. Strike it and water will come out of it. I was thinking about this moment at the cross, the exact same scenarios played out. Was God there? When Jesus was crucified, the father looked on close enough to see everything but with enough distance to allow it to happen. The same scenario that this pointed to happened at Calvary and the question, is the Lord among us or not, was on everybody's lips. But God was there the whole time at both. Have you had moments this week or in the last however long where that question's been asked, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord with me? We sang a song, one of those songs said that thou art with me, thou art inside of me and we are one. I don't feel that very often actually. Do you? It takes faith and understanding in the word and in his promises to believe that fact that he's not just with you, but he's ever present and indwelling us to help us through the most toughest times. But sometimes he's stood to the side to allow something 
that seems excruciating and seems like he's left the building but there is something else going on in the bigger picture that he wants us to experience. God was there for both. Okay, back to Numbers 20 again. I've lost my bookmark. You'll get good at it. Bring your Bible along and bring your pen. I'll give you permission to write, underline things. It's interesting going through my Bible. There's notes everywhere and then an arrow to here and you can see where I've done a sermon and I've forgotten that it was a sermon. And Then you find out more stuff. Back to Numbers 20. In verse 8, so we can read that again. Take the staff, you and your brother. So we've talked about the staff, the same stick. This is even the same place. Gather the assembly together. And now he says something different. We would have understood many of you and discovered this before. The same scenario, we're going to die of thirst and everything and everyone with us. God says, speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. The second time was different to the first. He was told to take the staff, but not to what? First time was, I was going to bring a stick and I forgot. You could use a microphone stand or something. For effect. But this time he says, don't strike the rock. He doesn't say, don't strike the rock. He just says, speak to the rock. The same scenario, but a little bit different instructions and maybe seemingly insignificant. Speak to the rock, what? Before them. If we can go back, is it? Or is it the next bit? Speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out their, the, its water. This was an opportunity for Moses to show the faithfulness of God and the power of God. And in fact, many probably, I don't know whether they realized it or not because they were either little kids or not born yet perhaps. But Moses surely would have known, we've been here and done this before. But there was, in God's instruction, no striking of the rock. Because, in fact, as we look at it, look back on these two scenarios, all it took was a confession of faith. A sentence that Moses needed to say was all that was necessary for the life-giving water to be released and all the people to be saved. So why only speak in this time when the first time it was struck? We're going to check out some of that. A confession of faith is all that is necessary. As Paul knew this scenario and it, it led me as I was thinking about this to our own story. In Romans 10, it says, the word is near you, kind of like, and it alludes to the work is already done. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. The striking of the rock is already done. It's like, oh, well, you're just playing with words there now. How do we really know that rock was anything significant? Corinthians 1 Corinthians 10, I think it is. Let's skip across there. Verse 1 to 6. I think that's on there, right? Yeah, cool. How we know there's a connection and how we know this story is bigger than just what the movie shows is because Paul understood it full well. Now, if you remember, Paul was someone who knew the... Old Testament almost backwards. He could quote things. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He, everything he did was in line with him knowing all this stuff and being able to quote it and knowing the meaning behind this. Well, so he thought. 
But when it comes to write to the new church that was born, he then suddenly realized everything he'd learned about Moses now points to Christ and the cross. And here he clearly explains it. Verse, chapter 10, verse 1, 1 Corinthians. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. The baptism is symbolized when we get baptized and it's sort of from there on in, it's like God saying, you've entered into my a relationship with me and I'm with you. These guys were baptized into the journey with Moses as one family. They were under a cloud that traveled with them by day and a pillar of fire by night, which I just think is mind-blowing. But when they passed through the sea, I believe God used that specifically to describe what happens to us as we pass from death into life. The entire people carried through the desert, through the through the sea, were baptized through the sea. Paul's making that connection. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. And then he says, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was who? Christ. So we're not jumping to conclusions here. Paul says the rock, the very rock Moses whacked the first time and was supposed to speak to the second time, symbolically and powerfully and spiritually, is Christ in the story. Before we talk about that anymore, see how it says they uh, ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink? We take part in this too. There are two sacraments that Paul recognizes and we recognize as a church. The first, as we've already talked about, is baptism, where you begin your journey, you lay down your old life, you take up your new life with him, you're symbolically washed away and made a new creation. And then the other sacrament we celebrate, which is actually next week on Sunday, once a month we do what? Communion. So there's a spiritual food and a spiritual drink that we partake of. And these guys lived it out every day. What was spiritual food? Bread from heaven. I don't know if it tastes like rice crackers like we have or, or the wraps, that whatever we tear off. They had it day in, day out. In fact, they got sick of it and made them grumble even worse. But I just find this interesting that... Again, something else in the story paints a picture. And now the rock, the spiritual rock that brought forth the cleansing water that saved their lives, it Paul's calling a spiritual drink. So what does that mean for us? We need both. We need the spiritual fruit of God. And, and Jesus quoted himself, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You can have all the stuff in your fridge. If you don't have the word of God leading you and helping you dis make decisions, putting him first, then you will surely perish and starve. They all drank from the spiritual rock. And this is, I'd love that some people reckon they found the rock. They've seen a rock with a big split in it on the side of the mountain and it's all smooth. It looks like water came out of it. I don't know how we could ever really know it's exactly that one. Or whether it was just the side of the mountain because when you think there's two million people and all the sheep and animals with them, it wasn't just a little, you know, drinking fountain that they all lined up for. It had to feed and and water all of them. That rock was Christ. The same who feeds and waters us. And the entire assembly is the one who fed them. Paul knew the connection. Moses should have been aware of that moment to teach them about God's faithfulness. And here's where it gets a little bit heavier. I was talking to Adam about this in the, in the kitchen this morning. 
and I pray we can journey with this a little bit because it's quite it's a big deal that Moses hit the rock twice if we go to Hebrews 6 4 I think it is is that one on the screen or do I add that one later no I thought that I want you to think about what Christ suffered on the cross and if he's the rock and he was struck early on in this the blood and the water flowed here we are again four decades later and symbolically they're in need again Paul was aware that you cannot strike the rock twice because once and for all Jesus did what he did and there need not be a second time in fact it would be a horrific thing to suggest that Jesus would have to be struck a second time have a listen to this this is pretty heavy in Hebrews 6 4 it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened so what are we enlightened with everything we're talking about the truth of God we are in need of a savior we're doomed without him and that Jesus has made the way for us this is the enlightenment not like the guys who sit cross-legged in the mountains of Tibet waiting for this enlightenment if Jesus isn't the answer then they've I don't know what they found something else it's impossible for those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift there we allude to this spiritual food we've received again and who have shared in the Holy Spirit who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age just sit with that for a second do you remember the day when you believe first believed some of you maybe it was a journey and all of a sudden yeah I actually believe this for me it was a moment in a youth camp at Toowoomba sitting around a bonfire with my camp leader I think it was called Sunshine Ranch was the camp and the man's name was Richard and I never heard or saw him again maybe he was an angel but we sat around the fire and I only remember it being the two of us I don't know where the rest of the people all the campers and leaders were but for this moment it just zeroed in on me and Richard and he's explaining what we're talking about that Jesus died for you every wrong thing you've done has been paid for should you choose to receive his gift of life and I knew there and then that there were no other options than to choose Jesus I guess I was enlightened my sitting near the fire and I was only 12 so I didn't really have the wisdom of the world or certainly the 30 years since of knowledge and experience that I have now but it was enough so he says it's impossible for those that have reached this moment and understood their need for a savior and then received the Holy Spirit verse 6 if they fall away to be brought back again to repentance now this is one of the biggest topics and debates that the denominations argue about can you lose your salvation and in my experience I find it very difficult to believe that anyone could fit in this category that you would actually understand that everything that Jesus did for you everything that you are now offered eternally to be in God's presence to one day just decide yeah I think I just want to go my own way I've known people and people in my extended family that I saw them go through baptism it's in this church in our youth group and they they just started as we came out of youth group and and the group kind of broke up as they went on and did other things after school they completely went the world's way and I asked one of these guys we were good mates and I said what's what went on did you ever really know Jesus and he said oh, thinking probably not oh, well that makes sense 
Because if you know him like I know him, you're not giving that up for anything. There is no downward trajectory away from Christ that for me doesn't end up in a crisis where I've got to get back to him. It might be a few hours, a week or two, or I just cannot live without the knowledge that God and I are okay. Nothing else matters. But Paul's describing a scenario and there's something in this for us that we take this seriously. If you really understood what was given up for you and received that. I was sitting on my front veranda this morning thinking, how do we picture what Paul's talking about? I want you to imagine you've done the most horrific crime. Don't imagine the crime, just imagine you're in big trouble and you're in court. And we've heard this illustration perhaps before where someone comes along and in fact, it's actually the judge himself comes along and says, I will pay your debt and you may go free should you receive this offer. There are two offers, you pay it yourself and you'll be eternally condemned, you're going to jail, you're not coming out because you don't have the funds to pay the bail. And the the judge, very well off man, but it still took his entire wealth to bail you out. And you receive that and you walk free. Imagine then going back and doing the exact same crimes after being released and being paid for to the such extent that someone has given all of themselves to bail you out. And you've gone back and done the same thing. What happens when you go back, oh, I'm in big trouble again. This time I'm going down for sure. However, that person bailed me out last time. Maybe this time, because now I fully understand what he did for me, we'll go back and see if he'll do it twice. There is no doing it twice because he gave everything. And you made a mockery of it. Paul's describing the most horrendous scenario he says it's impossible if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss listen to this they are crucifying the son of god all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace what jesus went through once was horrendous and we will never understand fully what he gave up and what it cost him So to receive that or say you receive that and then make a mockery of it by coming, well, maybe he'll do it again for me. There is no way. Once and for all. And all through the tradition of of the Passover and, and how he was our sacrificial lamb and it talks about the high priest would have to sacrifice sin for himself and then for everybody else. Jesus did away for all with all of that because once and for all his sacrifice covered and there'll be no need for a second. And we come under that. But if you watch a video like The Passion of the Christ... And even if it makes you sick to your stomach, I think you probably should when you're the right age. And if it moved you like it moved me, to know this is not just a story of a human being tortured because that happened a lot. But in fact, we went to the John drama a couple of Sundays ago and we're sitting in a room big, bigger than this and it's in a big circle and the part of the story comes where the entire crowd at the trial of Jesus was yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And it it builds into this crucifying, a shout and a chant. And it was blood curdling to me because they weren't just shouting, you know, for a soccer team or whatever. To me, that chant moved me on the inside because... And I actually read one of the comments of a feedback form That's, that a lady said, I, f- I actually said out loud and joined in and said, crucify him and then realized what I'd just done. 
I said, that's the point. That's why they do the John drama. We are the ones yelling, crucify him. We are the ones he's dying for. And it moved me and then the scene went to where he's on the cross and he's gasping for air and every time he pushed up to exhale, he was in extreme agony from the nails in his hands and his feet. I nearly, it was the most horrible thing to listen to for me. And that's not, I don't think, just because I'm soft. It's because to me, it's describing the one I love, what he went through. I had a dream decades ago, but it stuck with me. And maybe I've shared this before, but I thought of it again this morning where we were at at the home we grew up. It's on Happy Valley Road and it's a high set house. And my brothers, which is weird, three younger brothers, were having a go at me and it kind of escalated a bit where they were chasing me and they ganged up on me. And I was like, come on, knock it off. And they're like, nah, not this time, big brother. You're done. Okay, so I'll keep running. And then something in their eyes changed. And you're done. We're going to get you. I'm like, guys, I'm your brother. You know, Joel's just come back to the army, so I'm thinking, I'm not going to come out of this well. He's like, You can settle down now. No, mate, you're done. We're going to kill you. And the betrayal, our whole lives, all the things we'd done together, suddenly had turned and they were literally going to kill me. And I'm running for my life. And then suddenly, Dad turns up around the corner. I'm like, thank goodness, Dad. And I grab onto his shirt. Stop them. You're the only one that can. And what did dad do? And then I woke up. And I was dripping with sweat and I was freaked out. The father turned his face away. And I woke up and I said out loud, Jesus, what did you do? What did you go through for me? The ones you love most betrayed you, abandoned you. The father that could have rescued you allowed this to happen. What did you feel for me? What did you choose to go through? I think when we come to understand the power of what we're being offered, the thought of making Jesus or expecting him to do more is absolutely horrific and inappropriate. Do you get where Paul's going with this? Now, why are we talking about stories of rock? Moses hit the rock twice and God said, I'm telling a story here. You hit him once and the life-giving water flowed. Remember last week, the picture? He was struck by a staff, but this time with a spear on the end of it, and the life-giving water and the blood flowed. And from that, we are received into the family of God, and the church of Christ was born. That first time in Exodus 17, the water flowed and they received life. They didn't realize what they'd been given, and it took them 40 God years after that to get to the exact same moment again. It's only a matter of kilometres. And they've done a full loop for 40 years, maybe several times, and here they are again. Why does God say speak to the rock? Because the work's been done. The life-giving water is there already. You need not strike the rock twice. In fact, if you do, it means more than you will ever know. And you don't want to go there. Speak to the rock. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you will be saved. That's all he had to do. This is a moment of evangelism to his own people, a couple of million people. Jesus said, uh, God said to him, do it in front of the eyes of the assembly so they will see my faithfulness. 
go back again, Numbers 20. There's a little bit more. He said, you will bring water. This is verse 8. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. But speak to the rock very clearly. Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, like he said, just as he commanded, and he and Aaron gathered the assembly together, so they're all watching in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Now, I did a bit of research about this, and it sounds like, Yeah, that's what he's got to do. Nothing wrong with what he just said there. However, in Psalm 106, that phrase is quoted and it says, Moses used rash words from his mouth and was completely out of line. So something culturally in the way we translate it doesn't seem like that much. Whether it was, do me and Aaron have to do this for you? Or you are rebels when knowing that, There was actually a spirit of rebellion going in Moses as he said that. So now he's a hypocrite as well. There's there's something more here and maybe we do well to unpack it a little bit more. But Psalm quotes this exact thing. It says those words were rash, rash and out of line and were a sign of his disobedience. Must we bring you water out of this rock? He raised his arm and he struck the rock twice more with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. So he achieved that immediate purpose, and everyone went, yay! And Moses was like, yeah, I reckon you better believe it, me and Aaron got this. I don't really know his attitude, but I listened to a a Jewish rabbi talk about this passage, and he tried to get Moses out of the hot water by saying he was actually just a, a really great shepherd. And he, he knew if he struck the rock, he would have to not enter the promised land, but he would go with the other guys who had passed away before the promised land. So he really was just sympathizing with the people. And I'm like, what are you talking about? God said, you're in trouble, mister. And there's a reason. The people drank and the animals drank and it was a big party all over again. They suddenly had life-giving water when they were dying of thirst. Verse 12, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you didn't trust me enough to honour me as holy in the sight of the Israelites. As I've underlined that. What he was supposed to do was trust me, follow every exact word I say. If you're teaching one of your kids to do something it's a dangerous thing like operating a table saw or do it in this order don't put the wood on the saw blade before it starts which will find out what happens and it lucky it, the piece of wood missed his head but it went straight through his fancy window he'd put in his shed you didn't listen The timber has to be away from the blade, then start it, then slowly. And don't take the guard off, for goodness sake. You thought you knew better. You didn't trust in me enough to honour me as holy. And even more importantly, in the sight of all these assembly. This is your role. Very rarely did God speak face to face with anyone and give him word for word instruction and Moses just did his own thing. Ah, close enough. No. The holiness of the Lord is something to be feared and his instruction must be followed because we don't understand the consequence if we do our own way. If oh, I'll half take it on. I see too many people living a life of faith, of convenience. Yeah, it suits me to go to church because that's where my friends are and it's a good thing to do and I learn about God. And, but when it comes to actually morality, ah, you know, no one really judges me if I stay at my boyfriend's house or girlfriend's house or 
cheat on me taxes or whatever, you know. You got to do what you got to do, right? No, it's a faith of convenience, not a faith of conviction. And we are to make God seen to be honoured and holy because we talked about it last week. Holiness is holiness without a skerrick of impurity or disobedience. Paul says, work out your fear and tr- work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not that we so much fear if we are saved, but the the consequence of what has been given us is so powerful. We want to do everything in our power to live up to what we've received that others may know. And you may stress laying awake at night if you mess up or what am I going to do here? And that's okay because God will show you. But also know that the price was paid so you don't have to live under condemnation. I guess that's the other half of this message I want to touch on. You're not crucifying Christ every time you sin again because you've messed up. He's covered you once and for all time. Paul's describing a scenario that I, I don't believe fits us very easily. And I can't figure out why someone would knowingly turn their back on the Lord after having fully received him in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And maybe it could, I could be proven wrong and maybe that's happened. But for me, I just find it inexcusable or even impossible. Paul's saying it's impossible for someone to come back from that. And I'm like, I think it's impossible for me to even get there. I pray so. It might be possible for me to backslide far enough where I just don't care anymore. And maybe I would be the one to scrape through by the skin of my teeth. Or as Paul said, by one just escaping the flames. But I don't want that to be me because life is miserable if you're not close to the Lord. This is why we're here. You didn't honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites. You will not bring this community into the land I've given you. Because Christ is the rock and you had no idea what you were playing out. In the verse 13, did I give you that one? Finish there. These were the waters of Meribah, which is the same name 38 years earlier, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he showed himself holy among them. My prayer this morning is that we take this story and apply it to our lives in the moments we think, God's not even here and we've been led to doom and destruction. No, he is there. He's standing at the rock of Horeb just to be beside you and see what you'll do with this. Will you trust me? Will you by faith proclaim your trust in me just by speaking? How much easier could he have made it for us? You don't have to do this ritual and that ritual. It's all been done. The last words Jesus spoke before he past was it is finished so don't try and add to it because what you're actually doing is taking from what is offered as if it needs anything added to he gave everything emptied himself for you there is no striking the rock twice so i pray this morning that we would understand how powerful this gift is through the symbolism of the Old Testament and that it'll build your faith that the Old Testament isn't just the weird bit of the Bible or the cranky bit or the the rulesy bit. But we don't it's all there for a reason. And I don't know most of it. But when you spend a week with each bit you think, This is telling the story again. The blood and the water again. The blood and the water that we need, the spiritual food and the spiritual drink that we need. I want to pray this morning that something within these words, and if you'd go home and underline something and you pray through it, if you get a study Bible, it's heaps easier. In the margins, like it says, speak to the rock, then there's a little number E, letter E beside it, and says, this has happened in Exodus 17.6. So then you're like, easy, you can find it. 
Otherwise, Bible Gateway, punch it in and you'll see parallels. You can open things. There's a way that this word can come alive to you when you see how connected everything is. God wrote it. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would show yourself that we would represent you however that is possible in your holiness. That we would serve you with an obedience. And we know we can't do it to the letter according to what you said. But that our hearts may be given to you because you gave yours to us. Help us understand that any time we try and add to the gift of salvation, to make us a bit more righteous, we're actually making a mockery and means we don't understand what you gave and the extent of the gift. We get it for free, but the most precious thing in all, all of not just creation but eternity was given to us and anything we would do to try and add to that would actually just taint it we thank you for your love we pray that we would run recognize when you're with us even though it seems like you're not we thank you for the times where you actually test us, but we pray that your Holy Spirit will be the witness to us to, so that we know it's a test, that we don't respond in bitterness and fear and anxiety, that we say, Lord, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow or through the fire or through the flood, I know you're with me. And again, the staff is guiding me. I pray for people this morning that uh, have struggled and they're still trying to earn their salvation as if that were possible. I pray we, our eyes are opened more to the gospel's truth. Something so simple but something so profound. Nothing more important. As we sing this final song, Lord, we sing... He is worthy of all blessing, all honor, and all glory. Everything we have, you are worthy to receive in response to what you gave us because you gave us everything. You gave us life for all eternity. I pray as we have a time of fellowship or prayer that you will encourage people to, to ask for help or ask for prayer or share not sure what he meant by this or I heard him say this phrase what did that mean or what did this verse I don't like it maybe there's a reason we don't like it maybe we need to unpack that further but thank you that your word is living and active and it spurs us on towards love and good deeds and closeness to you in Jesus name amen Lord we thank you you're worthy we are not yet you make us clean by the washing of the blood and the water, that we may live with you. I pray our lives reflect this truth as we understand it more deeply from this morning, that we will see through the brokenness of others. We will love them with the love you have for us. We will serve them when it hurts. We will sacrifice the things we love so that others may see you. And if any would come to know you through what we do and the witness we are, Lord, lead us to those. What a joyous celebration when we sing with the entire assembly of every people, tribe and tongue and all the angels. He is worthy. Bless us, Lord. Go with us from here. In Jesus' name, amen.